Please open with me in your copy of God's Word to Matthew chapter 10. We'll be concerning ourselves this morning with verse 16 to verse 23. Let's set up the theme. You know, rejection is one of the most disturbing distresses that the human experiences. Everything from conspiracy trauma to the deepest kinds of depression, the sense of isolation and not being welcomed or accepted. This idea of rejection is, is among the greatest, the deepest, and the most painful. Rejection characterizes characterizes Christ's coming. And not to uh, base the glory of Christ's sacrifice on human emotion or to make too much of human emotion, but, but God cares enough to make much of our understanding this thing, this thing. That in, in a very important way, God is doubly rejected. In rebellion against our maker, we reject him. And in him coming to save us from that rejection, the only way we can be saved is to yet reject him again. Rejection then frames the thought of this passage and it's integral to the entire plan of salvation. I'm going to make an important statement. I want you to please just grab this for the sake of understanding the passage. This, this discourse here that Jesus is talking about, Matthew 10, verse 16 to 23 in particular, this discourse addresses the very heart of what is missing in the apostles' understanding about the Son of Man. What he's now going to say is going to be focused specifically on the very heart of what they're missing. A Messiah, a king come for Israel. Well, everyone can get behind that. The idea of, of a revolutionary new leader with power, who gives power, everybody can get behind that but they're missing this one most critical thing, rejection. So let's review because you see the first part, 1 through 15, what we covered last week, is really the first part of the entire plan being unfolded. Let's just review briefly. The Christ came to the Jews first. Remember verse 5? Don't go to the Gentiles or any road to the Samaritans, but go only to Israel. Go only to the lost sheep of Israel. Why? Why to the Jew first? Why does the Apostle Paul say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to the Jew first? Why the Jew first? Answer, because all of the promises of God to the nations came in and through the Jews. Therefore, for God to be a covenant-keeping God, for God to be a God who was faithful to His Word, He had to come to the Jews first. Faithfulness is the mark that is why Jesus came to the Jews first. Why, verse 1 through 15, stresses go only to the Jews. Because God is faithful. And Christ came to be faithful to the promise well, the second thing we noted last week, and what will be the theme of our section, is going to be rejection. Why to the Jews first? Because the Messiah had to be, he had to be rejected by his own. The very simple reality of this is striking. John 1.11, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Jesus had to be rejected by Israel for any to be redeemed. For any in Israel and any outside of Israel, for anyone to be redeemed, he had to be rejected by the ones God promised to come to. The rejection then 
is the focus of our passage. And I would remind us that in Romans 1.16, salvation is first to the Jew. And then also in Romans 2.9, judgment is first to the Jew. Don't forget that. Well, the third thing we are reminded of is why to the Jew first? Faithfulness, rejection for the sake of redemption. It is from the beginning God's wonderful plan of redemption. I know I've asked you to turn to Matthew 10, hold your place, and jump over a few books to the right and go to Romans 11. And let's just finish out where we left, pick up where we left off last time. Romans 11. And consider with me verse 22. If we take to heart in the weight of what has just been reminded to us, this idea that he had to come to the Jews first to be faithful to the promise, that he had to be rejected by the Jews in order for redemption to come to all. So here we have a summary. Romans 11, 22. Note then, church, the kindness of, and the severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, Israel, but God's kindness to you, Gentile church, provided you continue in His kindness. Don't take this for granted. Drop down to verse 30, please. For just as you, Gentile church, were at one time disobedient to God, Forever we were disobedient. We never were obedient to God. We were not the people of God. So you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, because of Israel's rejection. You have received mercy. Verse 31. So they too have now been disobedient by rejecting Jesus They were disobedient, like we always have been. But this is for a purpose. He says, in order that, by the mercy shown to you, through their disobedience, we received mercy. And now, through that, it is so that the mercy we received, notice this, they also may now receive, namely through us. We are to be witnessing to Israel. Look at verse 32. Here's the grand crown of the whole point of Christ coming to the Jew first to be faithful. He had to come to be rejected by them, and it was for the sake of redemption for all. And here's verse 32. For God has consigned all to disobedience. Checkmate. Checkmate. Nobody can say, it's because of my blood that I'm saved. Nobody can say, I'm better than you because I'm a chosen person. Nobody can say, it's my religion, it's my heritage, it's where I come from, it's my race, it's the things I do. Nobody has a claim. All have been disobedient. The chosen children, disobedient. The the neighbors, disobedient. So... God has consigned all to disobedience. For what end? That he may have mercy on all. So that everyone, Jew and Gentile alike, that means all people, would be humbled to see the greatness of God's grace. Because Jesus went to the Jews first, God is glorified in his faithfulness. Because Jesus was rejected by the Jews God is glorified in showing all men to be sinners and to be unworthy and undeserving of God. And then God is glorified in extending unmerited redemption to all. (laughs) Though a chosen nation, again, Israel proved unfaithful and undeserving, disobedient. You see, they were cultivated. They were the cultivated olive tree. But the cultivated ones are not the saved ones. Christ came to the humble through the rejection of the proud. That's why verse 36 says it's for 
from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. All glory goes to Christ. Let's go back to Matthew 11. Matthew 10, sorry. I want to ask you to look at verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 1, however, for our context in Matthew 10. With this reminder that it is because Christ had to come to the Jew first, let's remember the context. In verse, chapter 11, verse 1, he closes chapter 10 this way. All that is said then from verse 5, chapter 10, verse 5 on, all that is said is closed here where he says in 11.1, 1, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. So let's go back. Well, he opened his mouth in verse 5 of chapter 10. And all that he says then comes to a conclusion in chapter 11. That's the context. These are instructions to the 12 apostles. Now, I want you to notice some things here. We've got to put on our, our thinking caps for a moment. And, well, you should just always wear them. But, but <laughs> put on your thinking cap and, uh, and let's turn it up a notch and just take a, a careful look at the Word of God for that's where all the truth is going to be found and that's where the power is and that's what's most important. So let's take a look then. And I want you to see, not just hear me, but I want you to see something important here to frame our understanding. Number one, I want you to look at verse six and notice these brackets. It says, go rather to the lost sheep of, and it says the house of Israel. And now come over to 1023. And it says in the middle there, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel. Those form the brackets, the bookends to the context. So this is a unit of thought 10.5 to 10.23 presents a unit of thought, and there's bookends to it. Both of those bookends point to Israel, explicitly to detailed forms of like, only go to Israel, and over here, to the towns of Israel, all right? I want you to see that this unit of thought is broken down into two subpoints, two subsections, and the division is right there at verse 15 to 16. So, first section is 5 to 15. And we know that because notice how five starts. It says, these 12 Jesus sent out. And now look at how 16 starts. Behold, I am sending you out. Two markers that show same thought, but here it's narrative. Jesus sent out. Here Jesus is talking. I am sending you out. One other thing. Notice how both of them end. Verse 15 ends the first part by saying... Truly, I say to you, and the second part is ended in verse 23, where in the middle it says, truly, I say to you. You see that? Clear little rhetorical devices to help us frame our thoughts. This is all a discourse of Jesus instructing his 12 apostles at the beginning. This is to Israel for the cities of Israel. I am sending you, I'm sending you. Truly I say to you, truly I say to you. The first section talks about the manner and the second, the nature of its rejection. That's what's striking. It's just striking. This, what we have here in this passage is what I'm calling a rejection manifesto. Think about it. The king is unrolling the manifesto. Here's the program. Here's the plan. I'm sending you. What you're not going to get is I'm going to be utterly rejected. And if I'm utterly rejected, so will you be. That's the plan for the kingdom. What? doesn't compute. What? Well, it follows what is clear. He had to come be, to be faithful. He had to be rejected. Redemption will come. So let's keep this in mind. Jesus is here declaring the inevitable program. It's the manifesto. And it says in bold type, rejection. 
It publishes the plan of going to the Jew first, and it makes it very clear they will not receive it. It addresses the very heart of what is missing in their understanding. Remember, chapters later, we're going to come to Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus is going to say, who do the people of Israel that you've been touring, who do they say that I am, the Son of Man? Who do they say the Son of Man is? And no one got it right. So Peter steps up. I know. You are the Christ. You are the Son of Man. And Jesus says, well done. It's not from you. My father said that to you. He spoke it through you. And right then he says, oh, and by the way, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be rejected. And Peter, the leader who has the highest revelation at this point, stands, as it were, to Jesus and says, no way. Forbid it, Lord. No way. You're not going to be rejected. (laughs) It has to be something serious to deserve the, the response. Get behind me. Satan. Sounds like someone who wants to thwart a plan for the kingdom. Even with good intention. You're not going to be rejected. Peter, you still don't understand I'm going to be rejected, and so are you. Don't stand in my way. Wow. That's the heart of what they're missing. So what this passage does is it lifts their heads a bit, and for the first time, for the first time, that's why I called the manifesto, it's the seed form of the plan. For the first time, he's unveiling, this is what's going to happen, men. This is what's going to happen. He furnishes a survey of what they should expect. Beloved friends, isn't this exactly what any good commanding officer does? He rallies his special ops team. In his task force, he looks at them and he says, men, this is what you are going to expect. It's going to be this and this and this and this. Don't expect anything else. Don't expect anything less. I mean, even every good coach does the same thing. I remember in football, the coach at the beginning of the season, we haven't even played a game, rallies us together and yells at us and says, expect this. It's that kind of a thing. Jesus is telling them, this is what you should expect. And so the point I'm trying to stress is that, you know, Jesus sees with clarity things we don't even see. And what he's going to say here is so important, but it's progressive by nature. It's progressive as a disclosure. He's unfolding things they can't even comprehend. And so he's going to unfold them and set the big picture. He's projecting out, this is what it's going to be like. I want you to note that he does not here guarantee that all of these things will happen at once. He does not here say that this is all going to happen on your first mission. Just like any good coach or commanding officer, he's not saying, for sure, everything I'm warning you about is going to happen the first tour. No. It's just expected. Warnings are issued here. Persecutions are are foretold here. And they, listen, they will be repeated over and over. They will be repeated and they will come with increasing clarity. Increasingly, the disciples will see, oh, that's what he means. And increasingly, it will find application in the ages to come. So, I want to remind us that the hostilities were already there in seed form. And they would continue and intensify. They're already there. The Jews are already being, already being opposed. In fact, we're going to find in the very next chapter, they're going to be ridiculed and opposed, and there's going to already be a scheme to, to arrest and, and condemn Jesus. So, escalating difficulties. But this is the manifesto. This is what will happen, men. This is what will happen. This is what you should expect if 
you follow my command. Beloved friends, again, some of these things will be shadows of what will come in fullness only later. So one of the most important interpretive keys, one more thing, and then let's jump into it, is this. One of the most important interpretive keys is this. Whatever may be presented here in seed form, foreshadowing future realities, they, those things, those realities, those, those things said in seed form, they must have meaning to the original 12. They must have meaning to the original audience. They must have meaning even to the first reader, the first time reader of Matthew. We, again, just a warning and a cry. We, 21st century Christians, we carry all of the learning we have and we go to the text with it. And we look through filtered lenses. Strip it all away. And then what meaning does these, do these words have? They're listening with tremendous anticipation. What do you mean? This is what's going to happen and expect this and expect that. So let's come at it that way as a first time reader of Matthew and think with those thoughts. I love what the great uh, Greek scholar Henry Alford said. He said, wide import of scripture prophecy speaks very generally, not so much of events themselves as in points of time, as much as processions of events all ranging under one great description. I think he nails it. To understand things that are said in Scripture about future realities, you have to understand you can't just sort of strap them down to mean only one thing. The day of the Lord, for example, is stated multiple times by nearly every prophet, and it, it speaks of, of phases, of stages. It speaks of, of a progression of the day of the Lord. When Christ himself came in the incarnation, it was a day of the Lord. And yet there will be multiple days of the Lord. At Pentecost, Peter quotes Joel and says it's the day of the Lord. And then later Peter will write and say the day of the Lord hasn't yet come. Because that's going to be the end. Well, clearly the meaning is when God visits his people, it's called the day of the Lord. And there's going to be a progressive nature to that visit. A progressive nature to what's unfolding in that meaning. The same with the kingdom. The kingdom was promised. Jesus comes and says the kingdom is here. But then clearly he says the kingdom is not yet here. And then clearly he, throughout Acts, there's a message, repent for the kingdom will come, still future. So there's a progressive nature to it all. The same is true here. All right. It's important that we set it up. Now let's get into the text. The, the key is that this is about rejection. It's a rejection manifesto, and it sets out what the apostles should fully expect. Let's read it as a divine biography written supremely to reveal Jesus. So let us look into it this way. Let's look into Jesus' instructions to his apostles, his sent ones. Let's look into that to see more of Christ, to see more of Christ and to enlarge our view of him and to check our own allegiance to him. That's what we should do here. So there are three theses, three thesis statements that characterize this passage, all of them concerning the king's rejection. Here they are, number one. It's a reminder, verse 16. The reminder is, I am sending you for me. Look at verse 16. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. If one thing should overwhelm us in this text, beloved friends, if one thing should overwhelm us, it should be how profoundly majestic Jesus presents himself. Let me, let me phrase it this way. It is subtle to be sure, but nonetheless, unmistakable. Let, let, me, let me paraphrase this section this way. So listen carefully. Jesus speaking. I am sending you. You will be delivered over to the courts and flogged. You 
will be tried before the highest officials for my sake. You will have to answer to their charges against you. But I promise the Spirit will provide. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. You will be persecuted. You will have to flee from one town to the next. But know this, I will have dominion. That's a summary. I will be rejected, but I will not fail. I've come to my own first to be faithful. I will be rejected, but I will not fail. Now, I want to ask this question. Who, who can speak like this? I mean, who can rightly send such men on a mission and bid them gladly die for him? I mean, are you with me? Think with me. They didn't even understand the cross yet like you and I do. When we think of missions, we think, oh, yes, we're going to go and lay our life out for Christ because he laid his life out for us. That's not how they're thinking. They don't know the cross. So the call is even more difficult. You're going to go suffer and die for me. And they don't understand the cross. That gets me. You see, they didn't possess the spirit-born view of Christ's glory that will overcome them on the day of Pentecost. They didn't have that now, and yet still they trusted him. Still they gave themselves to his cause. There's a notable emphasis here on the fact that he sins. In fact, I love the language. He doubles up the pronouns like, behold, I myself send you. I love it. He's saying, listen to me. It is me who sends you out. And that's important. I want to I stress this because the imagery is fantastic and it's surprising. I, I want you to see something here. There's a surprising reversal, isn't there? Verse 6, what does it say? Go only to the lost sheep. And now I'm sending you as sheep, not to lost sheep, but to wolves. What? Weren't we talking sheep? Like they were without a shepherd and I was thinking maybe I'm the shepherd now. And now I'm a sheep. And now the lost sheep are wolves. Yeah. In fact, some of those lost sheep in just a couple years are going to gather together and scream, crucify him. They will be wolves. You're going to be rejected. You know, sheep are usually used as a description of those that wander. <laughs> uh, not here. It's not what he's talking about. He's talking about defenseless. Sheep are defenseless. They're not powerful. They're not strong. They have no claws to defend themselves. They have no teeth to defend themselves. They are not defensible animals. And next to a ravaging wolf... <laughs> proverbially, there is no hope. So here's the deal. This is not a call, like some commentators say, to bravery. This is not a call to heroism. Like, come, who will go die for their country? No. Jesus is saying, I'm not calling the brave. I'm calling the defenseless. Because it's not about you or your strength. It's not about what you can accomplish for me. It's about what I will do through you for me. That's, is anyone hearing this, like thinking about this? Isn't that amazing? Like shift our categories of thinking. I mean, let's think about this. What is the deal here? I'm sending you out a sheep in the midst of wolves. Well, who would think of sending sheep in the midst of wolves? I mean, first of all, wolves aren't the picture of probable converts. 
And secondly, sheep are not the picture of soldiers. They don't convert others. And yet, the stress and the language is, it is I, I myself, who am sending you defenseless. What's the point? I think it's this. Don't, apostles don't focus on them. And don't focus on you. Don't focus on the danger and don't focus on your defensibility. Remember, it is I who sends you. I am fully committed in my sending you. And I will accomplish what I set out to accomplish. I think there's something striking. I am your defender is the implicit idea. You can't defend yourself, so I will. There's a sense in which I'm sending you, I know, and I know the dangers, and therefore I will be there for you. Later he will say it like this, and behold, I am with you always. And uh, I think there's something else. It's kind of like this. It is not for you that I send you. Because this sets up the impossible case of incentive. There is no incentive here to say, here you go, here's a good pyramid scheme. If you just do this and then this will happen and then you'll go up and rank and da 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 da. <laughs> no, I'm sending you in an impossible scenario. It's not for you, it's for me. It is for me, you see, it's my mission and I will act through you. You will be my representative. This tells us something of Christ's own mission, doesn't it? Like a sheep among wolves. Because he will be rejected, they will be rejected. It's a rejection manifesto. Well, let me give you some of the details. We don't have time to get into all of them. They're so amazing and very colorful. But let's just think about this. First, I want you to notice he doesn't say into the wolves. He says, you're already amid wolves. The language is clear that it's, uh, you're already there, you're already among them. In fact, they're around us, but I'm sending you out. And the wolves, they speak of violence, they speak of uh, clever scheming, they're aggressive, they're skilled, they stalk and they kill. And I'm sending you there. The, the, main, the main takeaway, beloved friends, listen, the main takeaway has to be in this rejection manifesto, he's telling his apostles, don't count it strange. Don't be surprised. You will be utterly rejected. And that's why he says, be wise as serpents. Now, you know, the, 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 the word wise here, it uses the word for mind and it augments it. It's really colorful. But the, the main idea is keenness, keenness, like alertness and awareness. It's intellectual acumen. It's the ability for them to be aware of their environment to a very high degree. It speaks, it speaks very much of, of the understanding one's own surroundings. That's why it's related to the serpent. All the way from Genesis 3, the serpent has been known as the most cunning, the most shrewd, the most, the most prudent, the most the most keen, and certainly it's a characteristic of, of the reptilian family, and specifically snakes, they, they are aware of their environment, and they always are actively one step ahead for the sake of their preservation. They're very smart. They look, and they scan, and they figure it out. They're not foolish in that sense. They're, Psalm 58.5 characterizes them as cunning enchanters. There's the key. They have an instinct for self-preservation. That's part of what he's saying. Have this instinct in you. Have this, have this mind in you of the goal of the mission. And that's why he says, an innocent as doves. Literally, the word means unmixed. So be as keenly aware with an instinct of your surroundings and as unmixed in your motives as possible. You have no unmixed motives, no, no, no mixture. In fact, the only time that we hear of dove so far was in Matthew chapter 3, verse 16, when the Holy Spirit descends and it says, like a, tell me, dove, pure, 
unmixed, holy. They are to be like that, incredibly wise of their surrounding and pure in their motives. It's the only way they can represent Christ. It's quite beautiful. I think also the, the picture here is that um, to remind us, you know, the, the human tendency is to invert the two, isn't it? I mean, most of the time it's mixed motives for what we do, and we don't even apply common sense. We're not careful. Carelessness, recklessness, these things, Jesus says, no. You must avoid conflicts. You must avoid attacks wherever possible. You must be aware, but you must be pure. You see, because otherwise, when you scheme and you have high intellect, you tend to use it for your advantage, namely your advantage, namely your advantage, self-centered. And Jesus is saying, don't do that, do it for my advantage, it's for my mission. So you have a pure motive, a motive that isn't mixed, you're not trying to do this in your own, for your own gain, you're trying to do this for the right and pure holy reason. The spotlight's on Christ again. It's striking too, isn't it? I mean, most of these words are addressed to Christ's men and their mission, but the spotlight remains on Him the drama that follows, you see, <laughs> that what we have unfolding here, the drama that follows is not about the disciples. It's not about the apostles. In fact, it's striking because we know very little of their failures or successes in this mission. In fact, essentially in this particular first mission, we know nothing. So it's not about them. He says, go out, make sure you have this, make sure you have that, be careful because ultimately it's my mission. Well, we must, as we think about this, remember that analogy of the one who turns the spotlight should never be found in the spotlight. They are turning the spotlight on Christ in all that they do. And as we look into this biographical history, we, we should take away something profound, and that is we must come to terms with who this Jesus is before we concern ourselves with doing things for Him. We must remember that He sent them and it was His right, it is for His glory, and He does it, knowing well the danger. Striking. Number two, we see that um, He warns them. He reminds them that He's the one sending. He knows it should comfort them that He knows. It should comfort them that He's powerful and sovereign. But right now in the middle, He's going to tell them explicitly, I'm warning you, you will be rejected because of me. Look at verse 17. Because of men, or beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. Beware of men. It's the tense here is always be on your guard. And the idea is this, men, not demons. It's going to be men. It's going to be men that you know. Men that, that will talk to you and show one face and inside be another. It's going to be men. Beware. And then he goes on to say, for they will deliver you over to courts. Literally, the word is the Sanhedrins. You recognize that? It's a Jewish court. Like the Supreme Court in Israel was the Sanhedrin. The little courts were the Sanhedrins, the multiple courts. And by the way, history records very, very plainly, Jews did not flog Gentiles. So this is not about Gentile Christians here. This is still to the twelve. You will be flogged in Jewish synagogues under the rule of the Jewish court because you're Jews. And you are betraying. You are blaspheming what they think is true by pointing to me. That's the key. That's why Jesus says their synagogues. He distances himself, doesn't he? Not our synagogues, though Jesus still teaches in a synagogue. He doesn't say our, he's theirs. Well, we see this play out. I mean, we find John and Peter, Acts chapter 40. Or Acts chapter 40, there is no Acts 40. If anyone says that, turn him off. Acts chapter 5, verse 40. 
when they called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Verse 41, then they, let, then they left the presence of the Sanhedrin, the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. It's exactly what Jesus promised will happen to them. It also happens to Paul. The Apostle Paul says this, before it happened to him, he did this to Christians, Jewish Christians, before they broke out. Listen, Acts chapter 26, he recounts, Paul says, I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme, and in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. And then Paul later will account 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four, 24, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one. Five times I was flogged by them. Clearly, this is what Jesus says. Listen, this is what you should expect. He also says before governors. Well, he just turned the corner. Because before the courts and the synagogue, that's very Jewish. And now he turns the corner. Governors is the word procurator. It means a pagan authority over Israel. You'll go there too. And kings. Well, I mean, maybe like Pilate and Herod. That's exactly what we see. I mean, even Paul in Acts 25, 23, it says that, that he came. The next day Agrippa came, King Agrippa. It was great pomp. And they entered in. And then he came at the command, at, at the command of Festus, the procurator. Paul was brought in. So you have Agrippa, a king, and Festus, a procurator. It's exactly what Jesus said you should expect. The stakes are increasing, though, because, you see, the Jewish authorities could not take the life of a Palestinian. They could only flog them. But the Roman authorities could take their life. So by him doing this, Jesus is escalating. And he's saying even to the point of your life. And let me just uh, state the obvious. Would you look with me there at the, uh, at the middle of 18? You'll be dragged before governors and kings, what? For my sake. This is striking. I mean, he places emphasis in this final phrase, the all-important fact is it's for Jesus that they will suffer. Whatever they suffer, they will suffer for Him. They will suffer because of Him, not because of them. They will suffer by, because of His words, not because of their words. They will suffer because of His kingdom, not theirs. I find it striking that one, two, three, four, five, six times Six times the Apostle Paul, when he recounts his encounter with Jesus, when he retells the story, no less than six times, he tells the story different every time. But every time he tells the story, he always quotes one little statement. And that statement is when Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? I, I find that striking because the point is, when the church was persecuted, it wasn't the church that was persecuted, it was Christ. It's He so invests in this. It's for His sake. And the reason they persecute is because of Christ. And Christ bears it. Well, He also says to bear witness before them. And this is not like the King James has it against them. It's not against. The, the, the Greek here is, is before them. It's actually... A nice translation here, before them, it's, it's in front of them. In other words, the very fact that they will be brought before these highest, uh, highest authorities in the world is going to be a way for the testimony of the Son of Man, the true King of Kings, to be presented. They will bear witness before the highest authorities. That's, that's really what's going on, and it's, it's amazing. And he points out, and the Gentiles. A lot of commentators want to say, see, this is about missions outside of Israel. What? No, he's not talking about outside of Israel because the whole, 
All the examples I gave you were in Israel. You got procurators, you got Gentile kings, all in Israel. The point is about this idea of the highest authorities hearing, witnessing a commitment to this son of man that is beyond this world. Amazing. I do want to note this. It is the divine purpose of God to penetrate beyond Israel. The rejection is starting to lean and break through into redemption to the nations and It is God's design that Gentiles will hear, but it's not on the initiative of them yet. You notice here he doesn't say, you will go to the Gentiles. He's here saying, no, you will be dragged to Gentile authorities, and they will hear. Oh, this is so good. So good. And verse 19, 20, and 21, let me just summarize. There's a lot that we could say, but... I want to say this very simply, um, though they are to be wise as serpents, they are not to rely upon their wisdom for what they will say. He says, when they deliver you over, verse 19, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. Don't rely on your wisdom. Don't rely on your own words for what you are to say. It's like predetermined what you are to say, what you will say will be given to you. I promise you, I will make a way you will receive. I'm sending you and I will make a way you will have the words in that very hour. And he describes this. This is The joy of the triune God. Father is in this. Spirit is in this. The Son is in this. He sends them. He says, the Father, your Father, because of me, He's your Father. He will send His Spirit. He will be there to give you the very words you need to say. It's a beautiful picture. It's not your strength. Well, at the end, what we need to remember is that was displayed perfectly, I think, in Acts chapter 7. Stephen, before his own Jewish nation. And they're there to condemn him, and they've got stones, and they're ready. And what does he do? In the midst of this trial, he he gives 58 verses in the moment he needs to say them that rehearses Israel's history, the coming of Christ, and the gospel. (laughs) And they kill him. And that's why I think there's a progression let me summarize this part. This is, this is just summary. Jesus is saying this. Please listen to this part. Do not be surprised by persecution. You will have powers that testify of the kingdom, but you will not have powers to protect yourself. Beware of men. Beware of religious men, because religious men will oppose you. Civil authorities will oppose you. And your very own family will oppose you. Brother will give brother over to death. Do not trust in your own defenses. Do not trust in your own wisdom. You will suffer pain and shame because of who I am, not because of who you are. You will be hated by all because of me. So, trust me. It's not a very appealing call. It says something about the one who calls. There's something there magnificent about this Christ. Profound. Our last one is the promise, I will have dominion. Brother will deliver brother over to death. Verse 21. And the father, his child, and the child will rise against parents and put them to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Family, I just tremble at this. The place where you should expect the greatest loyalty and love is the place where you will find the greatest treachery. They will hand you over to death. Striking because the three divine institutions, the family, the church, and the government, all three will be against you. Amazing. Put 
to death. And when he says by all, he means all kinds of people, even family members. All, no discrimination, all people, natural, naturally born, all people. For my name, for my name, it reminds me of Exodus, right? Who shall I say sent me? Tell them, I am who I am. I sent you. It reminds me of that kind of weight for the name. For the name. It represents a revelatory power of who he is. That's what they'll suffer for. And I love it. The one who endures to the end. It's stressed there in the Greek. He and he alone who endures to the end will be saved. It doesn't mean he's going to earn it. It's about apostasy. It means if you defect, you apostate. If you go and say, forget this, and you walk and deny Jesus, well, clearly, you're not one of his. The whole point is, if you prove to be mine, you will go to the end and you will receive the kingdom. He's not saying you'll be saved from the the danger, (laughs) because the whole context is, no, you're going to be killed. So it's not the danger that I'm saving you from. It's when you persevere and don't apostate, when you don't defect and become a heretic and walk away from the faith, when you see the value of this son of man, you will stay all the way and at death, oh, I will receive you. You will be delivered. At death, you will receive the blessing of the promise of the kingdom. Well, it's a beautiful picture that he paints, but I want to close this now with just a few words, just very brief. Um, And this is really not something anyone should do, is try to give uh, an an answer to the most difficult text in the New Testament in two minutes. You shouldn't do that. Um, So let me just keep in theme with the point here. Um, At least eight scholars have said that this verse 23 is the most difficult in the New Testament. And... um, What I want to point out is something important. When he says, when they persecute you in one town, flee to the next, I want you to see how he's saying you need to accept martyrdom, but don't seek it. You see, the nature of man here is put on display, and the nature of God is put on display. The nature of man is this. um, They will put you to death. So if you think the nature of man, if you think highly of the nature of man, a lot of people when they become Christians, they get excited to go evangelize because they think this means so much to me. If I just tell people, it'll mean so much to them. And then they get deathly discouraged because instead of happily receiving the news, they want to kill them. So the nature of man is put on display. Be aware of the nature of man. He's not going to be happy about the good news. But also be aware of the nature of God. Because if you stress that, you are tempted to just not go. And isn't that hyper-Calvinism? There's the two on either side. A zeal without knowledge. And once you learn the nature of man, then you don't have zeal. So then you have knowledge without zeal. Zeal without knowledge versus knowledge without zeal. Both are wrong. Jesus cuts it straight and says, no, you need to understand the nature of man. Don't expect to be received. Expect to be rejected. But you need to understand why you go. You don't go because of their nature. You go because of me. The mission is not martyrdom. The mission is Christ. So the key is, yes, expect to be rejected, but yes, go. Because I sent you. And I think my last comment here is um, this point about verse 23. I want you to feel the weight of the momentum of the passage and just come down on the clarity here. It's all about rejection. Remember verse 14 and 15? It talks about if they don't receive you or listen to your words. He's talking about Israel. That town will be worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Judgment is ringing. And he enters into this theme of rejection and he brings it to a crescendo by saying, go through all the towns of Israel and you will not complete it until the Son of Man comes. A lot of people jump to the second coming. Makes sense because that's how it's used a lot. But that's not how it's used only. 
In fact, the same number of times it's used for the second coming, it's used for the cross. In chapter 16, Jesus, right after, right after saying that he is the Christ, he says, I will go to be crucified. And some of you standing here, standing here, will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming. Well, the only three standing there, James, John, Paul, or Peter, sorry, not Paul, Peter, Peter, James, and John, they will still be alive in the flesh when the Son of Man comes. What is that? John MacArthur says, I think, exactly right. That's clearly an allusion to chapter 17 in the Transfiguration on the Mount. Well, there we go. I agree with that. Most scholars agree with that. The point is, Son of Man coming does not mean second coming only. It means a revelation that might be progressive in nature. And the main answer then is this. Think about these things. First time reader, what does it mean? The towns of Israel? How do you make sense of that? If it's a second coming, what in the world does that mean? Towns of Israel have been exhausted by now. The theme is to Israel Go only to them first. Why? There's an urgency. They need to know I've come to them first before I go to the Gentiles. And the theme is judgment. And in Daniel 7, when it talks about the Son of Man coming, it's about Him coming to receive all power and authority and dominion to judge. So the Son of Man... There's an urgency. Make sure you go. Make sure you go. They're going to try to kill you. So jump to the next city and keep going to the next city and keep going to the next city. Make sure you do as much as you can, as fast as you can, because I will reveal myself as son of man. And then I will tell you to go to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. But I will have completed the commission that I'm giving you now. Well, with that said, I think it's a culmination, a big picture, it brings us to this idea that ultimately when Jesus could say in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, to the same, same apostles, he says, when you receive power from the Holy Spirit that has come upon you, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Ju all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. It's the same that he looks at and says, now go into all the nations all that happens after he reveals himself. Remember when Jesus said, he's going to the cross, and he goes, now is the Son of Man glorified. Going to the cross. He will reveal himself as the Christ, resurrection. Later, Peter will preach to Israel and tell him in chapter 2 of Acts, he will say, now he, the Father, has made him both Christ and Lord, Son of Man. So it's everything all about the transfiguration showing who he is. It's about the, the crucifixion. It's about the resurrection. And it's ultimately going to be about his second coming. And in the middle, with the destruction of Jerusalem, it's taken away from Israel. There is no more cities to go to. And now it's to the Gentiles. And it will be until his coming. Including the Jews. Always including the Jews. No one's discriminated. Well, beloved, I want to close this, and I mean this really quick. If you would look, just think with me, just think with me, okay? Let's just think. I think there's something even more, and I just close our thoughts here. I think the manifesto begins with Jesus, and we don't get this unless we see that. It begins with Jesus. Just step with me. Chapter 10, verse 16. Sheep in the midst of wolves. Luke says it this way. I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Lambs, like John Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus was a lamb in the midst of wolves. How about wise and pure? Jesus, because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification. Peter says that he was, we are bought with precious blood like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Pure, wise and pure. Jesus is the one. How about 17? Beware of men, for they will deliver you to courts and flog you. Well, men will deliver you. Math 20, verse 18. The Son of Man will be delivered over. And in the courts, 2659, the chief priests and the whole council, the Sanhedrin, were false, seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. 20, verse 18. They flogged him. 
And then it says you'll be dragged before governors and kings. Matthew 27, 27, they dragged Jesus before the governor, Pontius Pilate. Luke 23, 11, they brought him to Herod. And he would bear witness to them, even Gentiles. And Pilate the Gentile says, so are you a king? John 18. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And to the Gentiles, even to the Gentiles, a centurion standing by when Christ was crucified says, truly this man was the son of God. Beloved, I think my point is very plain. I, I think what's going on is ultimately this is about Christ. Ultimately, the manifesto of rejection, he leads it all. He shows it all. He doesn't tell them anything that won't happen to him. He shows that their salvation is based on this. They don't understand it yet, but it is the manifesto. He's the one who will be wise and gentle. He's the one who will be like a sheep. He's the one who will be tried in courts, who will be flogged and dragged before procurators and kings. He's the one who will be handed over by brothers. He's the one who will be handed over to death. And he will reveal through that that he's the son of man. May we walk away from that, seeing who he is, made in pact the choices you make today and tomorrow and the rest of your life. Whatever trials you're suffering, struggling with, facing, he's the king. He will have dominion even through the greatest rejection. He's the king. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege just to be here and to share the things you have taught me uh, to, to those that I love and care about. And I pray then that you would bless them, encourage their hearts, and help them to apply the things that we have now witnessed. I pray that Jesus Christ would be honored and glorified, for it is truly all from him, through him, and to him. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen.